All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, this talk will be recorded, so please blank your screens again or rename yourselves. Um, welcome to today's CREATE webinar. If you're unfamiliar with Cambridge Cares, we are the University of Cambridge's first overseas research centre, having been located inside the CREATE Tower in Singapore since 2013. Much of our research started out looking at ways to decarbonize the chemical industry in Singapore, but we have assist, since expanded to maritime, pharmaceuticals, and even cities-related research. Apart from CARES, the CREATE Tower is also home to many other co-located research centers in Singapore set up by top global universities and research institutes. This year also marks our 10th anniversary in Singapore. We have been hosting numerous events throughout the year such as these and producing many fun articles on social media. So check out again some of the links in our chat box to our web page that has more details, including our scientific showcase event that will happen at the end of this year. So you can register for that yourselves on the web page. All right, without further ado, please let me introduce Professor Nandas, who is the Cambridge Principal Investigator in the area of maritime decarbonization in the CARES-hosted Carbon Reduction in Chemical Technologies Program. Professor Nandas is a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Hopkinson ICI Professor of Applied Thermodynamics at the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. He is also currently the Combustion Research Coordinator in the Rolls-Royce Cambridge University Gas Turbine Partnership. It is very fitting that Prof Nondas will present today's topic, how combustion science decarbonizes our energy system. The talk will look at the complex combustion chemistry of gaseous and liquid renewable fuels and recent developments in Prof Nondas' group to harness their power to produce the next generation of propulsion devices and heating systems. It is not a matter of if, but when alternative fuels can become viable contenders against fossil fuels. So I look forward to hearing more from our speaker. I will hand this over now to Prof Nondas. Uh, Olivia, you can hear me okay? That, that seems okay to me. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to everyone for making the time for this talk. Um, the main purpose of this talk is one, to introduce you to some of the recent uh, advances we have made in the lab, but also I would like to share with you my enthusiasm with combustion science. Uh, there is a lot of funding there, more is needed, and we need people. So if you are a PhD student or an engineer looking for your next job, please consider combustion. Um, many years ago, I read a book by a psychoanalyst uh, called The Psychoanalysis of Fire. And uh, he was talking about the different facets of fire and flames. So we have the hell, the destructive fire, but we also have the hearth, the center of the family, the puring fire, the purifying fire. And combustion science is a little bit like that. Uh, in the very beginning, it was always seen as something productive. You really need to do this in order to extract energy. Then when we realized that combustion also emits nasty stuff like nitrogen oxides or particulate emissions. Combustion began to have a bad name, but combustion science was always there in order to help. And now, of course, with fossil fuels, we emit CO2, which is bad for the climate. So combustion is a dirty word again. But what I would like to try to convince you in the next 40-45 uh, minutes is that actually combustion is a very clean word and that it is absolutely necessary in order to move towards a low carbon future. So in uh, the next few slides, I would like to uh, explain a little bit what I mean by combustion. Uh, apologies to the experts in the audience because they may hear, they may see here some undergraduate type of stuff, but I know there are some non-specialists in the audience as well, and I would like to share my uh, a summary with them. What are the machines that we use today that use combustion, and what are the other fuels that we need to develop? I will show you some research results and some peculiarities 
of hydrogen and ammonia and some novel flame systems that are being developed. And at the end, I will make a summary. In the, um, in the, in the published abstract of the talk, I also talked about climate change and, how, and forest fires. So I have a couple of slides on that, how combustion science can help in that sense of decarbonization. We'll uh, deal with that when we reach that point. You may have seen this sort of graph before. It is the total contribution, is the contribution of each of our primary energy sources to our total um, energy. And you see here the traditional biomass, uh, the sort of wood that is being used in wood stoves in the developing world mostly. Coal, coal is on its way down and will probably uh, will go down a lot. Oil maybe has peaked, maybe not, but eventually will go down. Natural gas is going strong. We don't know if it will keep rising. But anyway, if you add this up, it's about 80%. So 80% of our current um of our current energy use is through combustion because that's how we extract this energy in order to get propulsion work or heating. So the renewables are these little bits at the top and these of course have to dominate if we are to save the planet. But from these renewables, I will show you some evidence that we need to make other fuels that have to be used through combustion. That's why combustion is needed also in a decarbonized world. So what are the machines? Here I have an album of various applications of combustion. Um, this is the view in a coal furnace. It could be a biomass furnace, like in the drugs power station in the UK. This thing is of the order of 10 meters, and it's hundreds of megawatts. This little flame is in my lab. It's a natural gas flame. A hydrogen flame doesn't look very different. Uh, it's been said that hydrogen, can, you cannot see, but actually you can. And it's again very blue and it would have similar shape. Uh, this is a power generation gas turbine. This is of the order of what, 10 meters or so, very high power. Uh, an A380 that goes from Singapore to Europe uh, has four of these engines. Each of them is maybe 25, 30 megawatts. So at takeoff, you have more than 100 megawatts, which is a lot of power, if you think about it. In liquid fuels, we burn in airplanes. Uh, this is how the flame looks like inside one of these combustors in the jet engine. Uh, each of these things, it may be what, five, six centimeters, and maybe five, six centimeters across, maybe 10, and it's of the order of a one megawatt per injector. So this engine has a lot of these injectors all around. For shipping, um, being in Singapore, we see ships around us all the time, and um, these big ships have very big engines, uh, extremely efficient, maybe the most efficient thermal engine uh, uh, around, um, again, large powers. Inside each of the cylinder, you have phenomena such as these, which is a diesel injection here, heavy fuel oil in the case of uh, the marine engine, auto igniting and then flame propagating. This is a photograph of an afterburner in a military jet. When we go away from fossil, the same machines remain, but now the fuel in the gaseous case, it's hydrogen or ammonia. And in the liquid case, it could be a synthesized liquid fuel or um, a biofuel. But the key technology remains the same. Nevertheless, we have to redesign our combustion system because these fuels are different. Combustion science is also used elsewhere, um, fires, Battery fires is a very rapidly growing field in combustion science, and there are hundreds of people that begin to work there. As these batteries become more dense in terms of energy, the risk of thermal runaway increases, and uh, we have all seen in the news these sort of fires. And combustion science is helping electrical engineers design safer batteries. 
When we see these photos and we look a little bit at what's going on, we realize that combustion has a huge range of scales. So the reaction zone itself, the production of soot or the oxidation of the fuel may be at the nanosecond, but then the residence time in the big furnace may be of the order of seconds. So you're looking at a range of 10 to the nine in terms of time scales. And similarly, in terms of space, some of the physical scales may be down at the nanometer uh, up, to, up to meters. Also in terms of power, some of our uh, small devices are a few kilowatts, like a small heater or hundreds of megawatts. A forest, say three, four trees being on fire at the same time, this is gigawatts of power. So it's a lot of a, a huge range of scales that we have to deal with. And how is this range of power or scales possible from the same phenomenon? There are two reasons. One is the pressure. So as in the machines, we have high pressure. Therefore, we have more air per unit volume. So this accounts for these large range of scales. But the other fundamental phenomenon is the turbulence. Turbulence, I'll be using this word a lot throughout my talk. Uh, turbulent combustion is vital. We need turbulence in order to mix the air and the fuel in order to have more and more mixing. So it is the turbulence to a large extent that allows this large range of scales. In practical systems, the flames are turbulent. So we really need to consider turbulent combustion. Why is it difficult to decarbonize some applications? Um, if something can be electrified, we should do it. But not everything can be electrified. Why? A few reasons. One is that for some applications, we need the high energy density of the liquid fuels. Uh, in this graph, you see the megajoules per kilogram in various energy vectors, and the y-axis is the volumetric energy, uh, so megajoules per liter. Batteries are down here. Hydrogen is here. Hydrocarbon fuels are somewhere here. Actually, the liquid hydrocarbon fuels are perfect for the technologies we need because they pack a lot of energy in a small amount of mass and a small volume. Therefore, this allows more passengers in each airplane or more cargo in each ship. If we were to replace, let's say, kerosene with lithium-ion batteries for uh, a jumbo jet or an A380, it would, it would take off, but it would fly only a few miles or it would carry only the pilot. I'm, I'm not joking. If you see the numbers, indeed, this is what's happening. So, for example, long distance uh, shipping, long distance flying, you cannot do with electricity yet. So the density is one of the reasons. The other reason is the charging time. And here I leave it, um, I will go through this very quickly. Of course, you're not expected to read all this. This is from my energy class. What I'm trying to say here is that if we compare uh, the density in an electric car battery with diesel, uh, we see that indeed it makes very good sense. First of all, you need less energy per mile when you go to electric vehicles. And in terms of efficiency, the combustion route uh, has already a 40% efficiency, the amount of work you get out of the engine as a function of the fuel that you burned, and then you lose some more to mechanical losses, but electrical drive has less losses. So this accounts for this very large difference in energy you need per mile. Uh, you need a lot of kilos of your battery in order to pack this energy, but for the sort of energies we need for a passenger car, it makes very good sense. So the lithium ion battery can be charged in about 10 hours, let's say with a reasonable charger and um, you're in business. The fastest lithium ion battery charger today is about 0.6 megawatts. Now let's see what happens in a big ship. Uh, I've put the numbers here for the ever given this was the one that got stuck in Suez, and we all smiled about how is it possible for a, a ship to, 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 stuck, to get stuck. 
Um, this is a very big ship. It has a very large engine, uh, 400 meter long. It may have about 10,000 tons of heavy fuel oil. Now, when these ships go out in the ocean, they you want to have enough fuel that they plan for about a month to stay out in the ocean. And uh, if we were to replace that energy with electricity, and I'm here making an estimate, even if the battery is 10 times better than today, then we need about three times the kilogram of heavy fuel oil, which is okay. Maybe it will carry less containers, but it will still be able to get propelled el electrically. So it's not so much the cargo loss that is the problem, but it is the charging time. Because in order to pack this electricity, in order to get all of this energy that you need for electrical propulsion, if you do it, say, through a 10 megawatt line, you need months. Or if you want to do it in a few days, you need gigawatts. Gigawatt is a very big power station, which means that the Maritime Port Authority has a problem because where will a port get all of this electricity? So in applications such as this, electricity is not on the table. So the energy has to be delivered in some other form, for instance, a liquid fuel. So in this sense, or a gaseous fuel. So in this sense, combustion has a role to play even in many years from now when we go even to zero carbon fuels. It's not just the CO2, it's also the other emissions that are important. And uh, in my career, uh, it's only the last few years that the word emission has been synonymous to, to CO2. It has always been about NOx and particulates. For instance, this big difference that we see from old airplanes, we see it in old movies and new airplanes, you do not see any particulates here, is because of combustion science better combustion modes. The fuel is virtually the same, but it's better combustion mode. So if we replace the hydrocarbon fuel with something else, we will have less soot. I said no soot, but this isn't true. There is still particulates being emitted. It's just that they're very small. And recently the emphasis has gone towards the nano particles. Okay, so let's uh, move a little bit on res research results and what flames really are. Um, I have fuel, I have air. If I leave them alone, nothing happens unless the air temperature is very high. So for something to kick off, I need a spark. I need an initiation mechanism. So the ignition of flames is very important. Uh, here you see some simulations borrowed from a colleague in Georgia Tech. We are doing similar things as well. The reason I'm uh, showing them here is to show you what happens when you have electrodes and the spark. You generate the uh, flame that then propagates and grows. This is a turbulent flame, so you see it is irregular. This is the footprint of turbulence. This is a photograph from my lab, similar thing. These are two electrodes, you spark and you see the flame. If you time average your photograph, so your exposure is over a long time, you see a thick flame brush. This is another uh, experiment from my lab. We have many different flames next to each other, mimicking the jet engine, where you have many injectors all around the engine, and you see how the flames interact. These are small ones. And this is a time average picture, but instantaneously you see a lot of fluctuations. So what is a flame? Flame is a chemical reaction taking place inside the fluid that moves. And the fluid motion and the heat transfer and the mass transfer inside the fluid is vital for the progress of the reaction. So it's this very coupled system where the rate of the chemistry is affected by the diffusion and the heat transfer. And when you fully oxidize, you have your final combustion products. But in order to get there, you go through a lot of different intermediates. Some of them may nucleate to produce soot, if you have, say, aromatic uh, hydrocarbons. 
In the case of hydrogen, you will have a lot of hydrogen atom. This is very diffusive and changes the nature of the flame. So a flame is a coupled system between chemistry and fluid mechanics. Actually, there is a lot of fluid mechanics going on in a combustion application. This is a schematic, a textbook example of uh, what a gas turbine system looks like. I have air with swirl. Uh, because of this angular momentum, when the flow expands into a bigger area, like in this combustor, I have the phenomenon called vortex breakdown, which means I have this recirculation. This slows down the air, but also helps disperse the fuel. The fuel is injected. So I have lots of fluid mechanical phenomena here, turbulent mixing, I have heat transfer to the walls. I have two-phase flow aspects like primary and secondary atomization. All of these things conspire in determining where the fuel goes. And then the chemistry kicks in and the chemical mechanism is important to tell me whether indeed I will have full oxidation and whether indeed I will have NOx being produced or maybe not complete oxidation or soot being produced. And if you are a gas turbine engineer, what you want is the temperature here to be uniform, not any vorticity to have survived because this will kill the turbine, et cetera, et cetera. And if you are a systems person, then you want all of this system to work very well with the compressor upstream and the turbine downstream in order to avoid the thermoacoustics. You need to be able to ignite it. The highest level of flying for an airplane is the one that allows the engine to be relit in the case the flame goes out. So ignition is vital and you want to, to have a stable flame. So you see here, some of the problems are fluid mechanical, some of them are chemical, but it's, so it's not just a fluid mechanics either. So in combustion science, what we have to do is make sure we harness the chemistry using the right fluid mechanics. And every time the chemistry changes, like going to a new fuel, we have to adapt the way we are doing this harnessing and this control in order to minimize the pollutants and make sure it works. So um, my students make fun of me because I use this slide often. Um, sometimes uh, I say that combustion is like the nine, uh, uh, headed monster that every time you solve one problem, another one appears as you're designing your combustor and, or as you're going to a new fuel, you want small residence time not to have knocks, but this uh, make, for instance, the flame uh, unstable and you lose it, or the flame goes to the wrong place and you burn the metal, etc., etc. So now, after decades of work with fossil fuels, we know how to do these things up to a point. And now when we go to new fuels, all of this knowledge has to be revisited. For instance, this is a schematic of how a hydrogen gas turbine combustion system might look. Hydrogen is very quick. The flame in hydrogen is very quick. So if you do not have very high speed of injection of hydrogen, the flame will flash back and attach to the metal and burn off the metal. So you've lost the engine. So you need to have high enough velocities to have lifted flames, but then you don't want to have too much pressure drop because your efficiency falls and you want to have mixing. So you have to come up with new ways of mixing the air and the fuel. So this is a one big change that combustion engineers have to do as they go to hydrogen. A similar schematic could be said for ammonia, for instance. If I want to burn ammonia, ammonia is very weak on the other hand. So I don't have a problem with flashback, but I have a problem with burnout. I, it doesn't complete the oxidation or I produce a lot of um, nitric oxides or nitrogen dioxides. So it is, again, this balance of different phenomena that we have to work with and we have to revisit every time we change fuel. This is a photograph of a hydrogen uh, burner we had we developed in our lab. It's 100% uh, hydrogen, so it's a, it's a very novel 
thing meant for aviation purposes, so it has to be quite compact, turns out to be very low NOx, and it's also fuel flexible, so it produces very low soot. Uh, we have a patent for this burner and clean aviation that funded this, made a little bit of a PR splash about it, and we have a new project going on about it. This is a small, low TRL work, still at the fundamental level, still at low pressures. We have a few years ahead of us before we actually see it in practice. But the main thing I want to communicate is that the research, because it has isolated the different phenomena that needed to be addressed, like the flashback or the blow off or the knocks, allow you to eventually build a device like the one I showed you in the previous slide or the one we have developed, that begins to look like a solution for 100% hydrogen and the same for ammonia. We do produce very low NOx, single digit PPM level is really good NOx, and the concept has been replicated by another lab, so it seems to be robust. This is called the lean azimuthal flame, and uh, as I said, we're trying to push it towards aviation industry. Let's go to ships now. Ships are completely different engines. They are reciprocating. They have large residence times, large volumes, and they know how to burn with very high efficiency the heavy fuel oil, even natural gas. Um, how will they burn methanol? How will they burn ammonia? Well, these fuels are weaker than heavy fuel oil and natural gas. And one of the first manifestations of a weak fuel is that you cannot ignite it. So if you want high pressures, because your thermodynamic cycle wants high pressure to have high efficiency, then the electrical breakdown in the spark doesn't work reliably. So there are other ways to ignite. For instance, something called jet ignition. So you have a mixture that is rich, so the best possible to ignite without any turbulence. Again, this helps. You spark here, and then the hot gases escape and uh, ignite the rest of the chamber. So I hope you can see this movie. What you saw here was the, I'll play it again, the flame growing in a lamina sense inside the pre-chamber, but escaping as a very turbulent jet into the main chamber. Here, there was no fuel in the main chamber in order to visualize what the jet is doing, uh, but this is how you would ignite um, a lean natural gas engine in a ship or one of these methanol and ammonia concepts. Again, the coupling of fluid mechanics and chemistry is vital to understanding this problem. We have published a few things here, and there are many comments here for the combustion experts, so I will go through them very, very quickly. Uh, in principle, you need to squeeze a little flame through this small orifice, and when you do that, you really stretch the flame. The flame sometimes is like a balloon. If you overstretch it, you drill a hole in it and you lose it. You lose the combustion. So there has to be a balance between the pressure drop across the orifice, the diameter of the orifice, the strength of the fuel in order to make this concept work. Again, you see the life of a turbulent combustion engineer here. We are playing with many balls in the air, the fluid mechanics, the chemistry, and we have to make sure the balance works right for each application. There is another concept for ammonia ships that is being developed. And uh, in our lab, we've done some work on this. This uh, looks like a photograph on the right. Of course, it's not photograph. It's somebody being extremely good with Photoshop. There is no ammonia ship out in the sea today. Uh, but the main idea is that in the future, we would like to have ammonia-driven ships. Ammonia is a really weak fuel. It has reasonable calorific value, but very low flame speed. So it's extremely difficult to ignite and uh, for flames to propagate properly. One of the ways that is being developed is to ignite through another fuel. So you have these dual fuel concepts. Some people use the word dual fuel from the perspective that I will have an asset, this ship, that 
can work with either heavy fuel oil or ammonia. This is up to a point true, but I think even in a very, if even if in most of your energy you want to be from ammonia, you will need some sort of promoter in order to get the flame going. And this promoter could be, say, a biodiesel type of problem. So I inject my liquid fuel that auto ignites nicely. And then I have all of these uh, hot spots that give rise to my ammonia air flame propagation. If I was to do this with a little spark, like in an automotive engine, the scales are such that it would fail and the flame would never reach the other end of the cylinder. There are many new combustion issues here. How does autoignition happen in the presence of another fuel? How will this flame develop? How we quickly will it go, et cetera, et cetera. And there is uh, simulation work and there is experimental work to make these, uh, to provide better understanding. I have a movie here from uh, my colleague, Professor Christine Roussel in the University of Orléans, who was one of the first to use this at her lab. So what you see here is chemiluminescence through the piston. This piston was quartz, so we could see through. There was injection of decane and the flame grew relatively homogeneously. So this was because there was a lot of different uh, combustion initiation points. Research such as this is vital to continue in order to be able to make ammonia engines. Is there any hope for having predictive theory? Um, turbulent combustion is at the intersection of two very nonlinear phenomena. Chemistry is a nonlinear phenomenon and also still a topic for research, especially for high pressures and especially for the new fuels. And also the pollutant generation chemistry is still a topic of research. So this is unknown number one. Then I have the turbulence. Turbulence, even in the absence of combustion, is still unknown. It is the last unsolved problem of classical physics, as Richard Feynman once said. And indeed, we need to advance in our understanding of turbulent flames and our simulation methods through modeling. So then when I sit at the intersection of these two nonlinear phenomena, I have much more modeling to do. So I'm living in uncertainty. Over the decades, there has been progress. We have consolidated to a few good models and some good ideas. In the next couple of slides, I have one of the models that we are working on. Um, on this slide, I'm showing you uh, a DNS, direct numerical simulation snapshot of a hydrogen flame. It's uh, from a lab in Germany. What you see here, is wrinkling of the flame. So the yellow is high temperature, the white is low temperature. So this is a hydrogen flame propagating. For example, is what you would have, say, in, in your airplane engine, if you think that the air is flowing and this is your flame. But this extra wrinkling uh, is not just because of the turbulence. It's also because of what's called thermodiffusive instabilities because the hydrogen is very diffusive compared to the oxygen. So you create these extra cusps and then you focus the heat and the heat diffuses differently than the molecules of hydrogen. All of these fluctuations are extremely difficult to model. So today I do not have a model that I can use in a, for example, CFD code that will reliably tell me what is the flame speed in, on an average sense of this system. But people are working on this. But what I'm trying to communicate to you here is that the basic physical discovery of what is going on in the, along this flame front is still happening. So the engineers who have to design these engines cannot rely on the usual route of having the physics well understood in the lab, then come up with uh, a higher TRL device, and then the physics goes to an industry in order to uh, develop the technology. Technology has to be developed in the absence of knowledge of the physics. And this makes 
the interaction between practical combustion engineers and the fundamental combustion scientists quite unique in compared to what's going on in other fields. This is the governing equation in the model that uh, uh, we're working on. It's called the con condition moment closure. I don't want to bore you with the details. I just wanted to say that, yes, it's not just empirical uh, information and in lab, but we're also working on complex equations. And these are actually very complex. This is a five-dimensional uh, PDE in space and time and uh, an extra mixing coordinate that is introduced. And we carry lots of chemistry, detailed chemistry, and all of that you have to do on the computer at the scale of the combustor. So these calculations take thousands and thousands of CPU hours, which means a lot of money and time. And there are ideas how to reduce the equations and uh, exactly what it is that you want out of them. But my main communication here is that modeling is evolved, but even today, many of these terms need closure that comes from research at the fundamental level. Professor Huang Wei Zhang at uh, NUS um, was one of the first to use this model when he was at Cambridge with me and to predict the full blow off curve of a, of a, of a flame. I think this is a major achievement. It was done for methane, swirl flame, uh, we have to do it again for ammonia and hydrogen, and we produce the full stability curve to within 25%, which is better than before. Maybe not good enough for industry, but better than before, but at a huge cost. It wasn't just one way's time, three years working on this. It was, of course, uh, a lot of cash had to be spent on the CPU hours in order to develop, to run these results. So... Um, this is not something that can be done very easily in industry. The same type of model we've used in the integra integrated research project in Singapore. And uh, for example, here it's some result of the temperature and soot for um, a marine engine. And we capture the pressure trace reasonably well for different conditions of start of injection. So some phenomena we capture okay. Uh, but some phenomena we're not capturing, okay, even for fuels that are well known. So the uncertainty increases when we go to fuels that are new. This is some recent work on the jet ignition problem. It is done by Harry, uh, postdoc in CARES. And uh, this is the jet ignition problem by larger dissimulation, where you resolve a lot of the turbulence, plus our combustion model and a lot of chemistry. Again, what I'm trying to say is that we have some tools that can help the engineers when they sit down together with us and we sit together with them in order to understand what it is that is needed from these simulations. Mm -hmm. Let me go to the final point of the talk about climate change. Now, what does combustion have to do with climate change? Obviously, we produce CO2. Uh, okay. One of the decarbonization ideas is the carbon offset. The carbon offset, in my mind, I don't want to talk about the moral aspect of it or the environmental aspect of it or the economic aspect of it. But the way I understand it is that I keep flying London to Singapore with today's airplane that burns Jet A and I tick a box when I buy the ticket and I don't know, $20 or something go to somebody who plants trees somewhere. Okay, this is good and uh, morally right, and I do it. Now for these trees to actually help with climate change, it means they must absorb the CO2 from the atmosphere, and indeed they do as they grow, but to be a permanent storage of CO2, they must remain alive. Now we all saw the news last summer, and maybe we have forgotten them already, that forests burn down. Forests burn down because of natural causes, let's say um, they get ignited because of natural sources, let's say lightning, as in Canada, maybe because of human uh, mistakes. Sometimes it is the electrical cables, as in California often, 
or by criminals uh, or by crazy people. There was this firefighter in Bordeaux in France who wanted to do firefighting, so he was igniting flames. And there are lots of other crazy people around. So there are forest fires. And humans begin to move towards forests. And some suburbs are highly um, vegetated. So we need to understand how fires propagate in forests. If you are somebody building a, a carbon offset type of forest, it would be nice if you knew how to build breaks into this forest to maximize the longevity of the forest and to minimize the risk for destruction. So we have looked a little bit at this problem and we realized that um, in order to make progress, you really need to look at the problem at the tree scale, at the very fundamental building block of the problem, because only then you can be very granular and help, for instance, answer the question, where should they do breaks so that the flame doesn't propagate? So how does a forest fire propagate? Imagine you have this tree that is burning, could be hundreds of megawatts for a few seconds, it radiates, hot gases touch the other tree, but it's also firebrands, embers, pieces of wood that is burning, that move with the wind, fly in a parabolic sense, and they hit the ground and they ignite. So you have the radiative mode of ignition, the convective mode of ignition, and the firebrand mode of ignition. It begins to look a little bit like the combustion science we've been doing in engines, because there too we have radiation, we have uh, burning droplets moving around, and we have turbulent convection. So we thought about that, and indeed we came up with a model that uh, uses some ideas from cellular automata formulation of forest fire modeling and turbulent random walk from uh, the Lagrangian PDF method of turbulent combustion. Uh, I'm not just saying that as, as jargon, but it is one of the advanced turbulent combustion models. Myself and others have worked on it. So in this um, uh, model, we mimic the random walk of these hot gases and of these firebrands, and we put some time scales of burning and some, some time scale of ignitions. In these nonlinear systems, sometimes with a little bit of time delay introduced into the system, you can get, get a hugely variable behavior and nonlinear. We put some randomness in the random walk, but we also put some randomness in the radiation. The overall uh, result is very satisfactory. And for instance, I'm showing you here the simulation from a fire in Colorado. In the beginning, it was just grass, but then it was wooden houses that were burning and propagating the fire in the other wooden houses. Thank God the authorities evacuated the people early here, so there was no injuries. And there was a lot of destruction, though. About 1,500 houses got burned, I think. But we captured the fire scar OK and also the time evolution. And the main idea is that we have built this ultra granular description of the propagation mechanism. Similarly to a very quick fire that was in Athens uh, last summer, um, it was initiated at the outskirts, the beginning of the mountain was a bushy area, not too many trees, uh, went up the mountain and then down again, driven by the wind and we capture the fire scar very well. And we're working on this uh, to, calibrate the model better, to build more physics into it. And as I said, I believe this sort of um, description of forests can be of importance for climate change. And as part of decarbonization as well, when we are starting to look at carbon offsets, because we want to make sure that these carbon sinks uh, remain there for a very long time. So I will close. Um, let me repeat some of the key points. New fuels, maybe carbon neutral, those that contain carbon, like methanol or biofuels that we create, possibly using renewable energy and some sort of carbon, um, or zero carbon fuels, such as hydrogen and ammonia. Again, we create them using renewable energy. They have serious idiosyncrasies in their combustion behavior. 
So we need to redesign to a large extent our combustion systems in order to bend them properly. And when I say properly, I mean get the energy out of them, but also make sure we do not emit other pollutants like nitric oxides or particulates. These new fuels, uh, we need to understand better their chemistry, their combustion chemistry and pollutant generation chemistry. So there is a lot of work going on there. And how you put this chemistry together with your turbulent flow and how you design the engine, again, needs work. You need a combination of experiment and theoretical research in order to understand the basic features and then to be able to translate this physics to engineers out there who have to actually design these engines. Uh, just a couple of comments. The rate of innovation must accelerate. In the past, we were used to doing something in the lab and waiting for somebody to come and knock on our door and take it and turn it into practice. This must change. We don't have time. There is only a few years until we really need to make a dent in our CO2 emissions. So combustion scientists must work together very closely with policymakers, fuel developers, the system integrators in order to make sure that the new system works properly. In terms of what would the system be, I believe that gas turbines and reciprocating engines will be with us for decades, but with novel combustion systems. So to the combustion engineers that are listening, I think you have a bright future ahead of you. And as I said, uh, this sort of work, uh, combustion science can also help with accidental fires like battery fires, also forests, carbon offsets, etc. So combustion is not a dirty word. Combustion science is there to help. And uh, I believe we have a lot to contribute. Thank you very much for your attention. All right. Thank you very much, Nandas, for the talk and for reiterating that, yes, combustion is not dirty uh, and we should be moving from emissions to solutions. All right. Um, I can open the floor now for questions. I think there's already one in the chat. I'll just read this out. Um, can the principles of combustion science, that is chemistry and fluid mechanics, be used in analysis of extremely hot plasma in nuclear fusion, or does that require completely different theories and techniques? Thank you very much for that, Vish. Um, so yeah, that's a very good question. I do not know about fusion. I know that many of the people working in fusion are thermofluid scientists. So they look at high temperature processes and how the turbulence and the chemical reactions move on. The time scales are different. Plasma turbulence is different but uh, there are some similarities. There is a new combustion technology around uh, plasma, but this is not the sort of plasma in the fusion community. It's a sort of plasma you see in sparks, um, in some, uh, also in some uh, medical applications like skin care. There are something called cold plasma where you want to have a lot of O radicals. And there are some technological applications using that sort of plasmas. You want to mix those radicals with your fuel in order to initiate the progress. So there are some people, many people working on these sort of ideas. Um, I think somebody, let's say from the perspective of a PhD student who is good in physics and had some grounding in fluid mechanics and reacting flows, I think they could get a job in fusion, although the contribution isn't exactly the same. I think as a training vehicle, it's reasonably close that they can do the jump. Thank you. All right. Um, yep. Uh, feel free to use the chat box or if you would like to direct message me as well on Zoom, that's totally fine. Um, I do have a question. I guess it's probably less research and more on the, um, well, bigger picture, but has being in Singapore allowed you to do different types of combustion combustion research that would, that would have been difficult in Cambridge? Um, I think Singapore is a wonderful place to do this research because Singapore really needs the new fuels 
and Singapore cannot be complacent and Singapore does not have huge access to renewables. So Singapore will probably import renewable energy in some sort of vector. Some of it will be maybe electrical. Some of it could be a liquid fuel that is um, uh, imported, synthesized from renewable energy. Uh, some of it could be hydrogen or it could be ammonia. And indeed, uh, we are participating in uh, proposals in these topics. Uh, I think also Singapore has the right approach. It's trying to put together the end user of the technology, the developer of the technology, and the scientist all around the same table. And it's only in this way you can actually accelerate the innovation to the speed that is needed. Um, I think this is very useful and uh, we should keep doing it. In the UK, okay, UK has its own issues, but um, some a lot of this work is funded by UK sources and also EU. Um, everybody is working on these topics. Hi France is investing very big on hydrogen, Germany the same, Japan is investing very big in ammonia. Um, yes, either as UK or as Singapore, we cannot be left out. Yeah, left yeah. behind. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I have a question from one of our researchers. Um, how are the chemical reaction networks involved in simulating the forest fire cases modified compared with those used in engine combustion chemistry? Um. So. Essentially, what we said there, and it's something that people in the engine modeling community have also said it sometimes, is that you pack all the details of the chemistry into a single time scale. So we've taken this very nice, um, uh, ve very, very strong assumption. Once you've done that, then you focus your attention on the fluid mechanic and the dispersion. And that is actually very similar. So for us to develop this model for forest fires, it wasn't a lot of work because we had already done some work on ignition of a gas turbine. And the model was very similar. So yes, we took some ideas. They had to be adapted to a different type of phenomena, but it wasn't completely foreign. So um, to answer your question, the, the chemistry might be different, but you don't need to solve for all of it. So you have to think which part of the chemistry is important and which part is not important. So that's where we have to work also with biomass burning scientists to understand which bit of the chemistry is important. Right. Oh, yeah. I can a... see. Uh, I... Yeah. I'll just Maybe continue. I can save time because I can see the questions. Okay, I no see problem. a question about uh, biofuels versus hydrogen-based fuels. Um, I think biofuels are a very nice solution for ships, for instance, because it's a drop-in fuel. You don't need to change your uh, in delivery infrastructure or your engine. Uh, there are combustion issues. Uh, the suit production is different. The um, flame speed is slightly different. The presence of the oxygen in the fuel changes things. Um, and I know there are many people working in these problems, uh, including ourselves. Um, Hydrogen-based fuels will be more expensive, probably, to synthesize. If we do not have enough land to produce, uh, to, to, to extract, the biofuels from, maybe we need to go through the hydrogen based. I think there is a very uh, healthy debate about this in the community, though. So I do not have the answer, I'm afraid. But um, from a combustion perspective, we should work on both. Uh, there is another question on fuel cells. Indeed, fuel cells for automotive or marine use are uh, they make sense for hydrogen. Uh, if you want to go to ammonia, you have to crack back into hydrogen and you have some inefficiencies and cost issues there. Um, you may have some ammonia slip through your cracker. So it is a competitive technology. Um, 
overall efficiencies might be similar when you look at the very large scales. So I haven't seen an application at the say 20, 30, 40 megawatt scale with fuel cells, but I think the fuel cell industry is very healthy and active and might deliver competitive uh, products there. Longevity is an issue with fuel cells and cost, capital cost, compared to the reciprocating engines and gas turbines. Um, but I think the community is working on those. Um, there's another question. People are talking about clean fuels, while others are talking for novel combustion models concepts, which is more important from, from an industrial point of view. I believe they are both equally important because we need novel combustion systems for the new fuel. I don't think we can burn the new fuels, hydrogen, ammonia, uh, with the existing combustion systems properly. So industry cannot just switch fuel. They have to redesign the engine, in my opinion. Do you see strength in close collaboration between energy companies and engine manufacturers? Where do you see best areas for collaboration? I recognize the... Uh, the the person who asked this question, very nice to see you there. Very good point. Um, I think in the past, this fuel was standard. So we knew what was coming out of the refinery. Now the refinery has to design a fuel that can burn properly. And this loop has to be done quickly. So I believe everybody must sit around the table in order to design the combustion technology and the new fuels, especially new liquid fuels. A little bit of that is already happening in aviation as we go towards sustainable aviation fuels. Maybe the same has to happen for marine liquid fuels as well. What are the next steps to a better understanding of hydrogen combustion? Um, hydrogen combustion at high pressures we need the mechanism. And when it comes to interaction with the turbulence, it is the thermodiffusive instabilities that produce much more surface area and therefore accelerate the flame speed in an average sense. And uh, both of these are very active topics of research. And there are multi-million projects in the EU around these two topics. So, uh, we need a lot of research in these areas. If we are successful, then we can have a computation fluid dynamics code that an engineer can use in a reliable way to design a new hydrogen engine. Thank you very much for your questions. I'm sorry I was very quick in going through them, but because there were many and I know we're under pressure of time, I try to do it like that. Please, if you want to continue the discussion or you have more questions, please feel free to send me an email. Yep, you have finished right on time. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today and Nondas for your time and insights. As Nondas mentioned, um, he we can feel free to contact him and if you need his email, you can ask ask me for it as well. Um, so this webinar will be recorded and uploaded to our website soon, and a link will be shared with all attendees in due time. So that being said, it's nearing the end of the day for us in Singapore now. So at Cares, we wish everyone a great weekend, and yes, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.